So um, good afternoon and many thanks for this opportunity to speak um, here today uh, in Copenhagen. Um, uh, I'm going to speak about match fixing in a general way and kind of set the scene for the other speakers that follow today. And, and just to, to start off, um, if you like, I want to um, quote from a very famous American football coach called Vince Lombardi, who's one of the most famous American uh, football coaches. And the thing that he said was, um, it's a very famous quote, if winning isn't everything, why do they keep the score? And I suppose what I'm going to say today and the premise of my paper today is if the result is fixed in advance, why do we keep the score? And that's, I think, the central premise because match fixing is a form of corruption and it robs sport of a core element of its attractiveness, which is its controlled, competitive unpredictability. If we don't believe what's happening in the park behind us here, well, why do we turn up? Why do we sponsor it? Why do we keep it on TV? And that's, I think that's a, a core part of really what I'm, I'm saying today about match fixing. And I'm going to talk about four or five things in a very straightforward way. First of all, match fixing is said to be a threat to the integrity of sport. And I want to talk about that word, integrity. I want to give you some context of what you're dealing with when you're talking about the gambling market in sport and the size of it and the money flows through it and potential dangers for money laundering. I want to speak about that. Uh, next, just a little bit about online gambling because that is something relatively new and poses its own uh, particular dangers. And lastly, to talk about how these risks to sport have been measured are being assessed and are being minimised in conjunction with the regulated betting companies. So that's the kind of the, the core points uh, that I want to make. Um, and I suppose before I make that, I want to give you two kind of contextual points. And that is, the first is, it's seen as a threat from the East. And Declan will speak about it in more detail. That there are certain jurisdictions in Southeast Asia where betting is not hidden, it's quite open, but it's not regulated in the way we see it. And that there are criminal syndicates there reaching across, in football terms, mainly to Eastern Europe, and targeting referees, officials, and players in fixing matches. And we have seen that in the Champions League and in the Europa League. And this is, as the president of the IOC said recently, now the number one integrity threat to sport. And that's something that we have to uh, kind of um, think about. And the second kind of contextual point is, we talk about this threat from the East as if it's kind of distant. There's also a threat from within. You know, and we've seen in Denmark this year, the first criminal conviction for match fixing. All right. And this weekend, or the weekend coming, there will be a big English Premier League game, Manchester United and Liverpool two mid-table, mediocre teams. <laughs> All right. 100 years ago, they were involved in a fixed game. 50 years ago, three England internationals were jailed for match fixing. And last year, about a dozen players in the lower divisions came with, uh, were prosecuted for match fixing convictions. There is a threat from within. And I think the key point that you have to note is not only is there a threat from within and this threat from the east, but there's a link now between the both. Who links it, who are these intermediaries, is a key threat for sport. And that's something that you have to keep in mind. And keep in mind that leagues, football leagues in Finland, in Serbia, in Croatia, in Malta, in Cyprus, and I could go on, have all had serious match-fixing threats. And we'll outline those um, as we go along. All right, so there are the kind of two general um, points um, that I want to make before we kind of go into a little bit in more detail. And the, the first point that I said that I talk about is this phrase called um, integrity. And why is match fixing seen as a threat to the integrity of sport? 
And I just want to kind of talk about that because it gives a nice kind of an overview. Um, when we talk about integrity, we talk about kind of morality and all that kind of jazz. You know, it's always difficult for lawyers to talk about morality and ethics, but you, you, get, the, you get the point. But when we're talking about sport, when sports organisations talk about a threat to their integrity, they're talking about a threat to their brand. If you don't believe, as I said, what's occurring on the field of play, spectators drift away, sponsors drift away, TV money drifts away. And that is why sport takes this threat to its integrity extremely seriously. Corruption corrodes very, very quickly. All right? And I'll give you a very practical example. You're all sports, most of you are sports journalists here, so you're sports nerds, okay? 50 years ago, 1965, what would be the big sports event that you would be talking about? What would be it? Don't look it up. It would be Muhammad Ali and Sonny Liston, the second fight, the phantom punch. That probably was rigged. All right? That fight would have dominated sports talk in 1965. It was for the WBC Heavyweight Championship. Who is the current WBC Heavyweight Champion of the World? Anyone know? And it's not one of the Klitschko's. Does anyone know? Without looking it up. And that makes the point. There is a sport that has imploded from within because of poor governance, corruption, and allegations that fights are rigged. If a sport like that can, be, can implode, can other sports as well? All right, and that, that's just a general example, but I'll also give you specific examples. If you look at the Indian Premier League, which is a cricket, which is one of the biggest brands, sports brands in the world. In 2013, its brand value was estimated at about 3 billion US dollars. And that had fallen from 5 billion in 2010. Because in the three years in between, there were allegations prosecutions and convictions relating to match fixing. In other words, the sponsors and key investors lost faith. And we see it by analogy with doping and the threat to integrity in sport. German, a leading German TV company paid 20 million euros to cover the Tour de France from 2009 to 2011. When yet another doping scandal broke out in cycling, German TV dropped the coverage, and the New Deal recently was only 5 million. We simply do not believe what's occurring in front of us. And that is the integrity threat. And that is something that I, I just kind of want to highlight for that. And remember, when you're dealing with this, you're not just dealing with what doping has to do, someone injecting themselves with microdoses of EPO. You're dealing with a huge huge market. Now these figures are slightly dated, okay, but look at the illegal and legal markets worldwide as relates to match betting. Neatly one trillion US dollars. That's a huge, huge figure and it probably underestimates it. And 70% of the trade is on football. Where you have huge flows of money, there is a danger of criminality where those flows of money are not properly regulated. Okay, and that's, uh, that's your problem. <clears throat> Here's a typical gambling market. I'll just go through it very quickly. This is the UK's gambling market. And you will notice, and I'm just planting the seed for you, you will notice that the main growth comes in online or remote betting. And I want to think about that and just plant a seed for you when it comes to that. All right. Now, before we go into some patterns about sports, um, betting and fixing. I just want to, um, this is a Council of Europe uh, convention. The, you don't necessarily have to, to read all of this, um, but it's about manipulation of sports competitions, which the Council of Europe, in its majesty, thinks is a bad idea. Fine, no problem. If you kind of read that generally through it, you'll see that's a very, very broad definition. It's a legal definition, but it's a very broad definition. Any manipulation of a sports competition is possibly cheating, is possibly rigging, is possibly fixing. But the point that I want to make to you, and this is, I think, important from this seminar, is that you've got to differentiate between cheating in sport that is done for sporting, if you like, purposes, and I'll explain what that means in a second, 
and cheating that is done for financial advantages on the gambling markets. There is a big, big difference. Okay? The first one, which relates to sport. Now, I could give you a few examples of this, but I may shame you. Okay? Okay, we all re uh, remember, the older ones in the room, sorry, uh, Germany and Austria in 1982. Okay? Was that fixed for financial advantage? No. For sporting purposes? Okay, benefit. In the Women's Olympics badminton from the last Olympics in 2012, we had certain nationalities deliberately losing matches to avoid playing higher seeds up along. Okay? In sport, they call it tanking, okay, where you deliberately lose to get a later advantage. It happens in American sports quite regularly, where at the end of the season, uh, teams will tank so they get a better draft pick the next season. Okay, is that fixing? What about Euro 2004? Well, explain to me, Danish journalists, what about Euro 2004? What about that infamous 2-2 draw? when the Italian manager at the time, Giovanni Trapattoni, recognised that a 2-2 draw would fulfil both teams, he went, it will be a 2-2 draw. Does that say more about the Italian mentality <laughs> or what happened in Sweden and Denmark? Okay? And now I'm not in any way, in any way saying it was fixed, despite the last minute goal. I'm not in any way saying, but you can see there are patterns and when, you show, when I show it to students, etc., you can see you know, it plants a seed of doubt. And this is something we have to avoid. We see with doping, where you have athletes having to prove the negative, I'm not doping, rather than the other way around. Okay, and there, these are the things. So we've had examples of betting corruption, you know, throughout di various different jurisdictions and in various different sports. From sumo wrestling, to Australian rules, to horse racing, to basketball, to Olympic handball. Every sport has been tainted by this, okay? And the question is, what to do about it? And what do we draw from those examples? And that's what I want to kind of go through today, these two things, the examples and what can be done about them. All right. Now, the first thing to say is that a key point within all this and a key point to how the betting markets operate and how these criminals within it operate is the more inside information you have, the better informed you are and the better you can jump the markets. Okay, are we happy enough with that? Who supplies that inside information? Players can supply that inside information. They can text from the dressing room. The striker isn't fit. We're changing our formation. Simple information. In cricket, they will tell you about how the pitch is, et cetera, et cetera. Simple inside information. And that is a key thing. All right? We also have different things. For example, there is a practice now, and we've seen it a bit in tennis, it's called court siding, whereby some unregulated betting companies will have someone court side relaying immediate information to get the jump on the betting markets. It's like insider trading on the stock exchanges, where you have these high-frequency traders. Okay? One of the biggest problems for the Indian Premier League, and we've seen it in other telecasts as well, is there is a 12-second delay between what actually occurs on the pitch and what is relayed in the broadcast. And within that 12-second delays, hundreds of transactions can take place. Yeah, that's a problem. All right. Related to this is this idea of spot fixing. And the idea is, traditionally, when you rig the match, and the big thing that you want is that you want to rig the score, the final outcome. But now we have an idea whereby you can get a player, we'll talk about football, to do something specific at a specific part of the game and make money on that concede a throw, get a yellow card, etc., etc. There's so many markets that you can bet on now. All right. S straightforward enough? All right. Now, when you look at that, 
first of all, spot fixes. You say, this is potentially disastrous. Give away a corner. You're not in any way affecting the result, but you can make a, a, few, uh, a, a few pounds on the side on this. So it seems dangerous. Okay, there's a very famous example from England, from cricket, where in 2010 we had Pakistan cricketers and they were asked to do something specific, which is a no ball, it doesn't really matter. I'll pretend that I know what cricket, how cricket operates, I'm sure you are as well, but it doesn't really matter, okay? They were told to do something specific at a specific time, all right? The chances of them doing that was over 500,000 to one. So if you put on one euro, you won half a million, okay? And they carried it out, all right? So you can see the danger. All right, there are two things about it. No regulated betting company would take such an exotic or strange bet, all right? No one would take such a bet. However, what was happening was, and what can happen with spot fixes, is that the fixer, the criminal, is softening up the player. Let's see if the player will do what I tell them. If I can get them to do a spot fix, I might be able to get them later on to fix the match. Okay? And that's an important point in all of this. And it's a point that I want to make. Some people will say that this match fixing threat is so big and it's coming from unregulated places that we can't control it here in Europe. But you can. There is a demand for match fixing in some places, but where is the supply coming from? Match fixers can have their money, they can put on a bet, but they need players and officials to carry out the fix. If you target your players and you educate them and you protect them, then the threat of match fixing can retreat. Okay? And lack of player awareness and education is a key point. Okay, and we've seen it in football in particular. Where are the pressures on players coming from? Okay, where are the pressures? Unregulated agents. FIFA has basically given up regulating agents. It's basically given up. Okay, and left it to national associations. We have seen it in unregulated private equity coming in and buying parts of clubs. That was the problem in Finland with the club Tampere. You know, the, the basically Singapore businessmen coming in and buying uh, certain parts of it. And, sec and lastly, we have third-party ownership of players. Okay? Even though technically it's now banned by FIFA, you have quite a number of Latin American players who have sold their economic rights to a third party, to an agent. That agent gives them money, invests in them, allows them to go to Europe for trials, and then essentially takes a commission off them all along. Can you imagine the pressure that comes on players from that? Okay? And that is something that we need to, to, to look at, that overall uh, context. The fourth um, pattern that we identify from match fixing is that games like tennis and snooker are extremely vulnerable. In fact, tennis is extremely vulnerable, and we'll hear later the problem. And why is that? Because the player controls largely the flow of the game. Okay? And I'll give you an example. Okay? Let's think of a tennis player, a notional tennis player. Let's call him Davidenko for some reason. Okay? Let's, let's think of it. So he's on the Masters Tour three set. All out to win the first set, loses the second set, retires in the third set. If you know that in advance, could money be made on the betting markets? And Nikolai Davidenko in 2007 got a slap across the wrist for just that. And because of it, tennis has set up a separate tennis integrity unit, which has caught about a dozen players since its inception, all involved in match rigging. Okay. And one of the things you find from tennis, okay, and we'll see it in other sports as well, is that the players involved are not the top players. Top players are usually, because of the amount of money they make, they're usually immune, okay, unless they have a gambling problem. Okay, but they're usually immune. What you have are players outside, say, the top 50. 
Okay. There's a very recent court of arbitration for sport case involving a tennis player who was caught match fixing or match rigging. And over his 10 year career on the Challenger and ATP tour, he admitted that he had only earned, cleared $86,000, roughly about $9,000 a year. Okay? And he was vulnerable to approaches, and he was approached. And we've also got to think of who's the most vulnerable player or, or person on the pitch. For example, in the England Premier League, players earn, on average, weekly, £30,000 a week. The average Premier League player. Okay? The referee is paid £70,000 per year. And he's the most influential person on the pitch. And we've seen, you know, from other sports, targeting of referees. Okay? Um, we've also mentioned tanking. Um, we've mentioned it in the context of the sporting context. But there is also betting um, analogies as well. And in the 2013-2014 season, we have seen a major scandal in Spain with regard to relegation from La Liga, with uh, clubs essentially selling their place. And of course, we've seen it in Italy for many, many years, including most recently in Serie B. We've seen this. And the, 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 almost the mentality is, and this is a problem, almost the mentality is, and this, this is open in Italy, that coming towards the end of the season, if you're safe, you're neither going to be promoted or relegated, but one of the teams who may be promoted or relegated comes to you with an offer. Are you open to that offer? And evidence has shown over a number of years that yes, that may be the case. And that is a cultural mentality that is dangerous. Okay, other um, points that I just want to make um, very, very straightforwardly is the last three points, I suppose, are this poor regulatory environment within sport. A sport that is badly governed is vulnerable to corruption. There is no doubt about that. And that, of course, includes FIFA. <coughs> a very simple example of that is in 2002, in the World Cup of 2002, um, which Ireland was at, I don't know, was Denmark at the 2002 World Cup? Uh, anyway, um, the 2002 World Cup, uh, South Korea benefited from a few pretty weird decisions. I don't know if you remember, particularly against Italy and Spain. And the Italians always alleged that there was a difficulty with whom appointed the referees. And they argued that the, and this is, has come out again this year, that they argued that you could trace the appointment of the referees back to a person called Jack Warner, who has been, you know, well known in FIFA circles. All right? And they always, and that's, that, you know, you've got to think about that. The second thing is this manipulation of sports results for financial purposes. We'll talk about that in a second, as aggravated by um, online um, opportunities. Okay. And the point I want to make about financial advantage, and it's a point I have made earlier, <coughs> we said that the global sports betting market is worth about US one trillion. Okay. Look at that figure up there. 400 million different sports betting odds movements every day. Okay. It's a huge financial services market. Very difficult to control the money um, that flows through that. And look at the, um, both of these figures here and here. I can make these slides available to you. But both of these figures here and here about the money laundering that goes on, possibly through this sports betting um, market. 100 billion euros, according to Sorbonne last year. And look at the winnings of fixed matches, could represent about 7 billion euros um, according to Sports Accord, that is six times more than the total global trade in illegal small arms. That's the type of threat you're dealing with. That's why IOC and FIFA, etc., are seriously worried about this. All right? Okay. And it's a very simple, probably too simplistic, but it's a nice way of getting it across. If you are in one jurisdiction, Asia, and you uh, have money f made from crime, 
you place it on a sports betting market in a second jurisdiction and you launder it through a third jurisdiction. And the bet you put it on is on a match that's fixed. You launder your hot money and you make a little profit on the way. It's a very simplistic way of looking at it, but it's the trouble with these figures here. Okay? And arguably, this has been aggravated by online betting. Online betting, the problem with online betting is it operates beyond jurisdictions. It, oper it can operate anonymously, or at least it's very, very difficult to trace the fixes. Okay? And also online, there's so many different types of betting. Okay? And a second point to note about online betting is are we moving towards this virtual currency called Bitcoin? And how do we even trace then where the bets are coming from? Okay, this is just some of the, the kind of things um, that we're dealing with as well. All right, so what can be done? And what is being done? All right, and I want to go through this um, pretty quickly just to kind of give you an idea because you'll hear a little bit more about it. And um, talking about what individual sports, international sports, national law enforcement, and uh, international law enforcement agencies are doing about it, okay? And before I, I do that, okay? Sorry, I went in a PowerPoint course and I had to show it <laughs> off, okay? Um, before I go through all this, all right, I just want to um, talk about one thing, and that is remember the players in question, all right? The players who are being targeted. Forget all the rest, other guy. Remember the players. Very interesting study done by FIFPRO, which is the Players' Representative Union, in 2012. Surveyed about 3,000 professional footballers, mainly in Eastern Europe. All right? Nearly half didn't have their salaries paid on time. And there was a direct link between these players who were being commercially exploited the approaches to match fixing and the actuality of match fixing. Where players are treated badly, there is a temptation for them to be tempted by match fixing approaches. And that is clearly something that FIFPRO were worried about. 55% of players approached to match fix did not have their salaries paid on time. And that's a significant and underestimated um, problem in this. Okay. All right, so with individual sports, what's being done? Well, there are a few things um, that can be, uh, can be done. First of all, a lot of sports are now developing what are called integrity units. And this has also been replicated, and Denmark is an example, this has been rec replicated on a national scale, whereby you have specific integrity units made up of accountants, ex-policemen, um, the regulated betting operators feeding in information into a single point of contact to identify potential problems. And then these integrity units having the power to investigate players, <coughs> prosecute under national laws or sports specific sanctions. It's this pool of expertise that is needed. And that pool of expertise works closely with the regulated betting agencies. This is a kind of a, an understated feature of it. The regulated betting agencies are vulnerable as well. A fix of a match is a fix of their markets. And that's why they feed into this as well. Okay, um, some examples, some good examples. The International Rugby Board has a very good integrity unit and probably the best at present is the tennis integrity unit which reflects the threat they feel, all right? Internationally, um, FIFA has worked on a nearly warning system, whereby betting markets, and we'll hear a bit more about that in a commercial sense, are monitored for unusual betting patterns, and that kicks in an early warning sense, okay? And we also have national models. And the national model in the UK, in Australia, in New Zealand, and something they're working towards here in Denmark as well, is that before you give a license to a regulated betting company, you oblige them in the license 
to cooperate with the authorities. If you have information on unusual patterns, betting patterns on a match, you must hand them over, okay? But who are you handing them over to? And this is an important question, and Denmark is having a debate on this as well. Who do you hand over that information? If I'm a private betting company, and I have very commercially sensitive information on unusual betting patterns, okay? Place that to one side. If I'm the police, and I have pretty sensitive information on organised crime being involved in this. Do I want to hand it over to the Danish Football Association? With due respect to the Danish Football Association, do I hand it over to any sports body? Raw data like that. Of course I don't want to do that for various reasons. And therefore what many countries have uh, established are specific sports integrity units who have the power, the authority and the competency to translate this information and punish people accordingly. And that's an important step. And that's all backed up by criminal laws which target specifically the match fixers. Right. So I suppose that's kind of my general point. And I just want to kind of give you a general point of introduction because I'm conscious it's coming up to three o'clock. I suppose we can kind of talk a little bit more in the panel about some of the uh, points that are raised on this but I suppose the two or three points that I want to make are this threat is not as distant as it appears it is very real the criminal syndicates involved and Declan will speak about this they don't care about sport they care about the profits that can be made with sports gambling as a conduit okay that's the one point the second point is there has been a little bit of debate about similar whether there should now be a world anti-corruption agency for sport rather uh, as a, uh, in conjunction with a world anti-doping authority. You have no chance of creating a world anti-corruption -cor uh, agency. Okay? We can hardly agree on the doping standards without agreeing on what is bad or good gambling or regulated longer. Okay? It will have to be done first to national government cooperating internationally. And the last point I want to make to you is, I suppose it goes back to, excuse me now for bending down, but it goes back to a quote and a paraphrase of Vince Lombardi, the coach I started with. And he said, you know, and I suppose it's just to paraphrase him, the perfect solution to match fixing in sport, I think is not attainable. But as Vince Lombardi said, if we chase perfection, we can sometimes reach excellence and excellence will do fine, okay? All right, thanks very much for your attention.